Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for making the time to join us today. I'd like to offer you a very warm welcome to Positive Luxury's Best Practice in Innovation webinar. This is a very special webinar for us and slightly different from our normal format because today we're going to be joined by the amazing winners of the 2022 Positive Luxury Awards. Positive Luxury's mission is to shape a sustainable future for luxury by redefining business models and rebuilding consumer trust. And our annual awards exist precisely to celebrate and showcase the brands, retailers and suppliers that are doing just this. Those businesses that are truly leading the way and shaping the very future luxury needs from supply chain to end product. So we're exceptionally honoured today to be joined by this year's award winners. And just some quick housekeeping. Today's webinar will be approximately 45 minutes long. In the first half hour, we'll be talking to each of our six winners. Uh, then time allowing, we should have 10 to 15 minutes uh, for you to ask our winners questions. Please do post your questions in the Q&A box in your webinar browser, and we'll do our best to get through them all. Finally, uh, before I hand you over to Positive Luxury CEO, Amy Nelson-Bennett, I do encourage you to download our complimentary award winners report from our website. Uh, there should be a link on the webinar browser as well, and this will give you more information on all our brilliant category winners. So on that note, I'm delighted to hand you over to uh, today's host, Amy, who will introduce you and introduce our 2022 award winners. Thank you very much, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, we're really lucky today because we are in the presence of um, six of the luxury industry's um, leading and most uh, trailblazing businesses and leaders from each of those six businesses. We were very lucky we had 115 applications for the 2022 awards. Reviewing those was, I would say, one of the best days we had in the office this year. It was an uplifting reminder of how much good is being done in the industry. Um, from that, we had the, the tough choice of shortlisting 24 companies. Uh, we then had an external panel of independent judges who looked at each of those six awards uh, and chose the most innovative and impactful in each of the six categories. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, say congratulations to all of you and make quick introductions. So I'm gonna start with Edzard Vandwick. He's the co-founder and, co 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 and CEO of Sheep Inc., um, the business that won the Environmental Innovator of the Year. Congratulations, Edzard. Uh, we have Philip Kaufman, founder and chief grower, potentially coolest business title out there, um, from Original Beans, the company which won Social Innovator of the Year. I'd also like to introduce Lucinda Pop, the head of design from Bamford, which won Product Innovation of the Year. Welcome, Lucinda. Um, all the way from Poland, we have Mateusz Paska, the electrical engineer from the engineering division of Belvedere Vodka. Uh, we have Berta Soret, uh, founder and co-CEO of Tracemark, which won the Breakthrough Business of the Year. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Megan Shearer, who's the Chief Product Officer from Monica Vinader, who won the Responsible Luxury Business of the Year. So we have a, a, a selection here of large and small businesses, young businesses, mature businesses, private and public. Um, they span the UK, the Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. They cover fashion, premium drinks, food, and jewelry. Um, but what each of these six businesses, what they all have in common is a really inspiring vision, a very, very strong sustainability purpose. Um, I was thrilled to see tangible evidence of impact and innovation and a demonstrated commitment to transparency. So on my favorite topic of transparency, I want to start with you, Edzard. When we first met, um, you and Michael shared with me the way that you had sort of reversed traditional thinking about designing the entire concept behind Sheep Inc. And it, it was ultimately that end-to-end -end approach to traceability and transparency that the judges were so impressed by. Um, so could you just explain the process you went through to create this amazing brand? Um, thanks and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so I think fashion as many of you will know is obviously suffers from being a very opaque industry and a 
large part of that problem actually arises because of the way traditional supply chains are set up and the way brands approach traditional supply chains, which often involves brands starting at the kind of manufacturing stage. And then as slowly as you kind of go back through the supply chain, the visibility becomes less and less. And the result of that is that brands often don't know where their raw materials come from. and Therefore, they don't actually have a full awareness of the impact behind the entirety of their supply chain. And this is a huge problem in the industry. Um, and at the moment, it's a very hard problem for a lot of the bigger brands to unpick because, again, they have such kind of dense, convoluted supply chains that actually getting all the information and being able to be 100% transparent is actually a very, very tricky enterprise. And so we, I suppose, in that sense, we had the, the benefit when we, we set up Sheeping because we said, well, we don't want to obviously end up in that problem we want to be 100 percent transparent we want to have a very innovative supply chain setup the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we actually turn that model on its head and start at the raw material stage and kind of work our way up through the supply chain so that we can really have control on every single element kind of working it's working its way through the through the process to get to the end product uh now we sell knitwear um so merino will knitwear and um Merino wool we kind of landed on as a material because it's a um, it's a natural fiber. It has a lot of amazing technical abilities. Um, so it has the benefit of it being a, a, if you make products out of it, it can be a very long lasting part of your wardrobe. But a huge problem with merino wool is an obvious one. It comes from a sheep. Sheep is a methane producing animal. Like how can you justify that in your supply chain? And so through the process of actually starting at the raw material stage, again, we were, at, we were able to kind of innovate at every single stage. And that started really with how do we source merino wool? And the way that we do that is we worked with very specific farms in New Zealand that were at the forefront of the regenerative farming movement. Um, so we kind of cherry picked a couple of farms um, that very much were kind of fighting to be not vilified like the rest of the farming industry as being such huge contributors to the climate crisis. Um, and we sourced a very specific merino wool from them. And through the way that they manage the land and through the way that the processes work on, on the land and the way they integrate the sheep, they were actually able to have a carbon negative impact at the raw material stage. So every kilogram of wool we source from them has a natural carbon footprint of minus 14 kilograms. And this has all been independently audited and put into ad by, by a third party. Um, and then what we did is we, we, it became almost a kind of connect dots exercise where we kind of worked our way through the rest of the supply chain and just made sure mm -hmm. that we could, again, have a kind of real tight focus on, of course, quality, but also on sustainable innovation at every single stage. So once we had the raw wool, we then needed to figure out how do we now clean it in a way that is, again, more environmentally friendly. So we worked with um, a, a yarn mill in uh, a scour, uh, called Clean Wool Scouring. Um, in Italy, that is the first B Corp registered textile mill in Italy. Italy. And then we um, treated the yarn using the treated the wool and turned it, spun it into yarn using um, a proprietary treatment that doesn't use any harmful chemicals. It's all blue sign certified and is all applied using renewable energy. And then at the next day, the final stage, the actual the knitting stage, when we create the garment, we do that in Portugal um, on these amazing machines called Shimaseki whole garment knitting machines, which produce very, very little waste. And importantly, in our case, also run on a solar power panel array on the roof. Um, so through that whole process, we were, we were able to have a supply chain and create garments that um, after, again, after a third party audit, audit came out as having a naturally carbon negative footprint. Um, so every garment that we produce naturally takes more CO2 through the way the supply chain is set up than, um, than gets produced. Um, so the net footprint is basically negative. Um, and that was kind of like the way that we set up the brand. Um, to be totally honest, it took about a year for us to get all the proper certification in place. That was like a big part of the challenge. It was like we, we knew that we kind of had a very optimally set up supply chain. But a big part was also making sure that it wasn't just us making these claims, but it was also um, very much validated by a third party. And that took about a year to do a lot of um, on the ground research, at the farms and soil testing, etc. cetera. Um, and through that process, again, we were able to create a, um, a product with a naturally carbon negative footprint Print, which is now our entire range is naturally carbon negative so the idea there was really how do we kind of prove that you can you can set up a fashion brand that can actually have a regenerative impact rather than just either trying to be carbon neutral which point you neutralize your impacts or um, be in any other way destructive thank you and that's why sheep and hoodies are um, commonly found amongst the positive luxury team in the office as you can imagine <laughs> it's, it's um, an extraordinary process that you went through and i would encourage everyone to join the sheeping flock and 
products and check out how they communicate their uh, credentials and their consumer communications as well. Um, Philip, chief grower, I want to turn to you. Um, Original Beans is, has got one of the most sort of comprehensive and tangible action plans I, I've seen from any luxury business trying to address the sustainability challenge. Um, and you work in the food industry, so that's um, particularly difficult. Um, what I remember when we were really going through your application as, in a, as a team is the way that we felt you were chipping away at what felt like really big issues, social and environmental, through really effective local actions that, that just felt, they felt authentic. They felt like you understood the needs of the communities across your value chain. Um, it was really impressive. Can, can you share with, with people today how you've designed and implemented one of these really interesting social initiatives such as, such as the Bean Team or, or another one um, and what has been the positive impact for both that local community but also for, for you and your company? Yeah, thanks, Amy. Actually, it's wonderful to follow up on Edzard because he's laid out so much of what regeneration is and what a regenerative agribusiness uh, can be. And we are in food, which means in agriculture. So I think of our own business as an agribusiness. Um, my own mission really has come through my ancestors and has very much to do with forests and protecting forests and the nature part of things. And that's really the way I approached regeneration. So it's all into climate and in, into selecting origins where we source our cacaos from that are close to uh, protected areas, rainforests, big rainforests. We work with indigenous people. So it's this big nature thing. But um, why I'm so pleased also that we won this social innovation award is because it ultimately comes down to people. And now in our industry, of course, we know through all the news uh, about chocolate that the social component of uh, cacao and the cacao industry is at least as dramatic as the one of fashion. And we do have a Bangladeshi kind of situation in chocolate, like, like the Bangladeshi fashion, which is in West Africa. And um, the growers of cacao are the poorest people in the world. So that's sort of the lay of the land. Now, if you want to go out and do good and create a product that is best, you have to really go out. So our principle of, as Edsard said it, you know, bottom up, uh, immediately uh, asks the question, how do you get community leadership into a situation that you cannot control? Like, how do you go to the poorest, most remote villages in the world, in Eastern Congo or Northern Colombia or somewhere in the Amazon? and build something that ultimately ends up in the luxury industry in terms of its quality, its integrity. Um, and that can only be happening if local people feel fully empowered. And that's a long process of building trust and being on the ground. So what we've done all along is essentially build local uh, teams, mostly agronomists of, you know, of the region that would work with the growers on a very regular basis. In Congo, we have a team of seven who constantly go out on motorbikes and bikes to the villages and the growers mm -hmm. and help them think through not only what cacao agroforestry is and what a good product should be, but also through their day-to-day -day needs because these are the most disenfranchised people. And if they do not feel empowered, if they don't have confidence in uh, getting money when they need it uh, and all the other uh, things that, that they lack, um, they will have to do other things. They will have to take other priorities. So one of these uh, examples is, is the way in which we worked in Congo already for, I guess, uh, six years or seven years. And over that period, we noticed um, sort of the leadership of women and the lack of their role in the community. Um, women are in charge of firewood, so they are in charge of the relationship with the forest. They are in charge of um, how to, you know, send their kids to school or not. They, they are very much leading in the community, and yet traditionally the money goes to their husbands. Those are not necessarily um, patriarchal, radical husbands, but that's just by tradition. We meant, immediately thought we're gonna, not going to change that tradition, but what we can do is figure out how we can empower these women 
to step up within this local industry, this, this grower uh, industry, um, in particular roles. And we figured out certain roles, one of them, for instance, quality management, which wasn't really something that was happening. So we put in trainings on quality management. We put in trainings on leadership. At a certain point, we realized that if our field team wanted to communicate with the women, which is uh, possible through mobile phones, um, the women actually couldn't really, you know, mobile phone SMS uh, communication, the women actually couldn't return because there was uh, the problem of uh, illiteracy. So okay. we put in uh, literacy trainings. And over time, what we've seen uh, is exactly what we ever dreamed about, which is um, a community that sort of starts acting on its own. We've seen uh, initiatives like um, micro lending of women to each other, which we didn't instigate. We've seen uh, local chocolate making, something we never dreamt would happen in a place that doesn't have a cacao tradition like in Latin America. So there's been all these um, sort of growth of I initiative just from the fact that we had a local team, we put in a, a, the time and the work to educate Kate people, to give them an opportunity and pay them fair prices. And what that gives us as a business, of course, is the confidence and the kind of trust, which is probably the most effective currency one can ever have, certainly mm -hmm. in such uh, out there uh, situations, to build our supply chain, to trust our supply chain, to trust our qualities, and just to be confident if we move forward in the market. In addition, of course, to inspiring stories. Yep. Wonderful. And um, for those of you who haven't tried um, Original Beans, hopefully um, Philip's um, single story there, which I can assure you is, is one of many very, very interesting, inspiring stories about how they have built trust, as you would say, um, make their chocolate taste very, very, very good. So we, we, we've got a, a growing legion of fans. Um, I want to go back to sheep because we're, we're obsessed. I blame Ed Zard. It started with Sheep Inc. Um, but Lucinda, I want to talk about Bamford. Um, you're the head of design. You've worked for this company for, for seven years, which um, as, as an employer who, who, who is um, focused on um, her employees and, and trying to maintain them within an organization, seven years is amazing loyalty in this day and age. Um, can you tell us about the vision for the Homegrown Merino Collection, which is what won this award for Bamford? Can you tell us how it was brought to life? But can you also talk to how Bamford's sustainability purpose and projects like this one um, how they've impacted you as an employee and whether they've contributed to your longevity with the business. Yes, thanks, Amy. And firstly, on behalf of everyone at Bamford, we're so proud to have received this award for product innovation. Um, so thank you so much. And so nice to see two Merino uh, brands winning awards as well. Um, that's really, really exciting. We're really inspired by that. Um, so yeah, going to sort of the vision for our for our homegrown merino project really starts with the heritage of the brand. Bamford have been around for 15 years, and we were built on the belief that we need to be more mindful of our connection to the earth when designing clothes. Um, so certainly, when I started here six and a half years ago, the first thing I was asked to think about was to think about the soil. Uh, so our founding pillars for the clothing collection are keeping craft alive enduring design, uh, uh, preferred materials, community and collaboration. Uh, so that's been unchanging for 15 years. Um, but what we wanted to do two years ago um, was actually do the best of, that was our, our vision, to do a homegrown UK-based uh, Merino project. Uh, why Merino? All the same um, you know, properties uh, as, as She Pink have just mentioned. Um, but also to have a, a British merino sheep is the absolute finest micron of, of fleece that you can grow here in the UK at about 16 to 19 microns. Um, so the next uh, level up from that would be the blue faced Leicester sheep at about sort of 24 to 28 microns. So we're really looking at the finest possible micron of fiber that, that, um, that we can use here in the UK. And then the vision was to keep the entire project here on British soil, uh, which was a big challenge for us. Um, and another part of this vision was also to bring Bamford closer to our sister brand, which is Dalesford Organic Farm in the Cotswolds, uh, which has been 
organic farming for 40 years, but has been known as Dalesford uh, Organic for 20 years now. Um, so we have a huge following at Dalesford Farm. You can go there, you can see where your food is grown, where your organic carrots are being grown in, in the market garden. So why not have the same approach to clothing where actually you can go to the farm and see our organic sheep grazing there? Um, so that was certainly the vision, is can we make a collection that's better for the planet here in the UK? How was it brought to life? Uh, the innovation really begins um, with Leslie Pryor, who brought the Merino genetics back here to the UK over 15 years ago now. So we're really grateful for that early part of the innovation. And then she allowed us to steadily um, grow that flock by us taking on 10, just 10 sheep at Dalesford Organic Farm back in 2019. Um, and so that's sort of the beginning of this story. And then certainly the supply chain, it's, it's not just here you know, at Bamford, it is the knowledge from the farmers, the scientists, the vets who are looking after the, the sheep, the shearers, the scourers, the spinners, uh, the technicians and the knitters. Um, so this supply chain is, is really um, very tangible there. And when it comes to the manufacturers, we're certainly looking at UK, UK based second uh, generation uh, manufacturers and um, second, third generation, which there's so few left now, and um, which we're very conscious of, um, of supporting. Um, a big part of bringing this collection to life was celebrating the undyed color of the fiber. Um, so the, the color of the, sh the merino sheep that you see in all the photos and you can go and see at the farm, we really wanted to celebrate that natural chalky shade of the fleece so we don't use any dye which we learnt has saved about 12,000 litres of water um, just by celebrating that natural shade and then where we knit the product up in Scotland we've obviously got the beautiful soft pH of the water in Scotland so those the, the fibre and the water they go hand in hand to, to create this really beautiful quality and then to kind of close this the cycle on how we brought that project to life um, was by measuring uh, the carbon footprint, which was again done independently. And it's the first time we've ever done that across Dalesford and Bamford is to really scrutinize the entire carbon footprint of a product. Um, so that was a huge project for our team here at Bamford and Dalesford. And that was, uh, scrutinizing every single piece from the livestock emissions, uh, from the diesel on the tractors, uh, the emissions from all the factories, all the way down to the tiny little safety pin that we attach the label onto the clothing garment. So we really would, out of curiosity, uh, we wanted to know exactly, um, is this the future of sustainable luxury by reducing our, our carbon emissions? And um, the results were astonishing that um, we, we were able to reduce carbon emissions by 96%, um, which is um, amazing, really exciting. And um, for many of our manufacturers, you know, in the, in the Scottish knitwear industry, the spinners, the scours, they've never actually been challenged before on, on what sort of energy they're using. Um, so it's definitely... Um, a big progress. And then the last point of your question, Amy, was how this project could influence um, you know, people working for the company and, and being an employee here. And I, I come in from more the design side. And um, so I think the biggest learning curve for me and the thing that's so exciting is that luxury clothing really can have such a, a symbiotic relationship with nature. And to be able to design and work directly with the farmers and and sheep and animals and soil looking at the soil health there's so many exciting projects going on at the moment with british wool mm. so that's inspiring we all need to work together and so certainly as an employee for a, for a brand you can actually um through through practice take you know care for the planet and and put that into practice uh, so hopefully that answers your question. It does, as does the, the huge smile on your face throughout, which was 
So you, you look happy and proud to be doing that job, which is, which is, which is fabulous. Um, <laughs> Mateusz, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head over to, to Poland now and, and, and go from sheep um, to vodka. Um, so Belvedere, um, the winner of this year's material and manufacturing innovation of the year represents 600 years of tradition. It's regulated by the Polish vodka legal regulation, which is notorious for being one of the strictest in the world in the spirits industry. Uh, Belvedere is a large and successful brand in its own right, and it's part of the powerful LVMH group. Um, your distillery um, dates back to 1910, but it was the first spirits distillery to, see, to receive a grant from the European Commission to pilot a, what is really a, a very ambitious biomass capture facility on the site. Um, now the project went on for, for three years um, and, and came to fruition last year, but can you tell us about some of the challenges you faced, how you overcame them implementing this project, and what learnings and, and positive outcomes there have been for Belvedere and, and its numerous stakeholders that are, that are interesting for, for the audience today to hear? Uh, of course. Uh, thank you, Amy. And uh, first, I also want to thank for this award in the name of our company. We are really happy that someone appreciate our efforts and and uh, everything that we did uh, in with this project and in the uh, in the environment standpoint as well. The biomass facility and the project that it was um, was making was very hard from the beginning. We at the at the first level of it uh, faced challenges on the on the laboratory even test stand uh, level. We had uh, because we not only want to use the biomass as a fuel but also the distillery the decoction. So yeah. in the proper proportion, proportion. So this type of fuel is uh, not uh, used very commonly. I can even say that uh, I don't know if anyone else uh, used that as the fuel uh, in their in their facilities. But uh, we had to cooperate with different universities uh, in Poland with scientists and uh, do the test in the controlled environment with this type of fuel to even check how much efficiency we can get uh, from burning it, uh, what technology we need to burn it, and uh, how it's gonna um, how it's gonna help us and how it's gonna help the environment and how we what we can do uh, to make it work. So uh, after after a lot of work and a lot of feedback from people, very smart people from Poland, we were able to to get a uh, correct technology and connect it with each other, and that was another very very hard uh, challenge to overcome because the biomass facility is made from the devices from different uh, parts of the world as well. Our boiler room is from Sweden. Our generator is from England. Of course, uh, recovery heat system is from Poland. So uh, we have to coordinate the work of different groups together, uh, cooperate with each other and, uh, and uh, make everything work. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, everyone put much, much work to it and uh, try their best uh, to overcome this challenge. So. It was only good to will of people as well uh, that f uh, know what mission we have and they were determined to help us with that. So that was another one. The, uh, unfortunately, when the COVID situation appeared, that also very complicated our work. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to we had to take this into account when we were doing our our work, and we had to to have to we had to respect the uh, time and effort of other people and their health, of course, but at the same time, we want to finish the project as soon as possible because we were we were determined and we really wanted to to switch from our gas fuels to biomass um, because we really believe that it's the future of the of the of the fuel industry and uh, from the other uh, small companies as well uh, to use it maybe maybe in theirs in their work. So this was very important. We also uh, we also had to build a whole new part of the building uh, to to keep our devices inside 
and that's another that was another very challenging uh, challenging level of the project to cooperate with uh, another again with other companies uh, and um, schedule everything uh, to work uh, to work uh, to work together uh, but at the end everything works so we are very happy about that in the in the end, we achieved also 80% less CO2 emission to the atmosphere, and from the environment standpoint, that's very that's very good news. Um, in every employee, almost every employee, of course, in Belvedere believes that the, that the making of the product should be not only priority from the economical standpoint, but also from the from the sustainability and uh, and environment standpoint, so everyone was cheering us up very much uh, and uh, helped us with their good spirit uh, to finish this uh, as well. Thanks to this project, of course, uh, we also have some economic uh, economic uh, positive uh, impact for, on our company uh, because of the situation that is right now. Uh, we will have the return of our investment in. Uh, Two and a half year. Uh, at the beginning, we are we are thinking that it's going to take eight years, but the gas prices went up and the situation changed dramatically. Uh, so, um, so this is uh, this is from economical standpoint very very good news for our company and our shareholders, of course, as well. Yeah. And and there is also the efficiency boost uh, from our for our company as well thanks to this new technology we can use 20% uh, less fuel uh, to produce our our product so that's again from a standpoint uh, very good news for us and uh, innovation uh, compared to our old uh, boiler room uh, is also the generator now we can produce not only one type of energy from our from our fuel, but two types of energy. So we can say that we almost uh, we are uh, almost uh, energy independent uh, from mm -hmm. the from the other source of energy uh, in the correct periods of time. But yeah. in the time of the production, uh, we can buy 60% less uh, electrical energy from the power grid from outside of our company. So. So that's also very uh, good news from an economical standpoint for us. And uh, in, the, in the correct periods of time, we will be also able to sell the electrical energy that we produce from biomass. And this is also very good news for, from the environment standpoint, because our energy is green energy. And other companies uh, in my country, in Poland, is is trying their best but uh, we are leading in this innovation and the most of the electrical energy that people uh, use is made from coal and of course it's it's not very fuel friend environment friendly fuel uh, to use uh, so the biomass that we burned uh, is of course uh, environment friendly and we can sell this energy also to other people to use in their houses so, um, we learn a lot about, about biomass as well. And yeah. because we learn a lot and we overcome many challenges, uh, we can now help others to implement this technology to their companies and we can tell them what to, what to, what to, uh, what to see, what to, what to take care of and uh, what's, the, what's the challenges to overcome and how to prepare for them. So uh, this knowledge is also, uh, I could even say a little priceless at this point because not many companies are, are, are doing this type of, uh, this type of project. So, so we really, we, we are really, uh, really proud of this. And uh, we are every day learning more about biomass. We, we try our best to, to uh, ar archive this knowledge and uh, improve in other aspects of, uh, of making a product. Uh, uh, so that's, that's basically. Thank you, Mateusz. Uh, Diana, our, our co-founder of Positive Luxury, always says that ultimately uh, sustainability is really all about collaboration. I think the Belvedere project um, really illustrates that and it, it feels like you're getting a huge amount of, of various different types of benefits for it. Um, and I know it was incredibly hard work talking to some of your colleagues while it was going on. So congratulations on that. 
Um, and thank you for the information. Um, Philip, I know has got to, um, Philip from our, our head bean team um, leader and head grower has got um, an issue he needs to take off. So I want to thank Philip for um, joining us today. I want to thank him and Original Beans for setting such an extraordinary example for the food industry, for agriculture and for luxury. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Um, I now want to um, speak to Berta Surrett from Tracemark. So Berta, the, the call for traceability, in my opinion, is, is often way too focused just on the fashion industry. Um, and given the numerous environmental and social issues that I think most people know surround the jewelry and the diamond industry, we were so thrilled when we got your application and the judges were so impressed by the work that you've done. Um, so as Breakthrough Business of the Year and the founder of Tracemark, can you explain, first of all, just what Tracemark is? Can you share with us some of the stories you've shared with me about why you founded the business? Yes. And then talk to us about the impact you aim to have on, on the industry you're trying to help over the, over the coming few years. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. And thank you so much for the award. Really, you made my day, my week, and my year. I'm extremely happy. <laughs> And so um, I'm the founder and CEO from Tracemark. I come from a jewelry fa family for over 40 years in the field. So when I was, you know, from an early age, I knew two things. One, that I wanted to work in the diamond and jewelry industry. And second of all, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, as my father was. So after I graduated, I started working next to my dad, like close, you know, like hand to hand. He was like teaching me like, you know, like all, all the experiences and, you know, it was like the, such an amazing time with him. And after just three months, I read a report from Human Rights Watch where I read like all the depressing facts that there will still happening in the diamond and in the gold and in the jewelry industry. So when I was reading that, for example, we are here talking, having this beautiful webinar, but there are still over 1 million children working in gold mines today, like illegal. Or for example, that the 80% of the gold that Brazil and Colombia exports to Swiss refineries comes from illegal mining, where I'm not gonna say where it's going there, but uh, you can Google it. Like when I was reading those facts, like I remember I started crying because I felt that the values that the jewelry industry were, you know, selling were not aligned with the reality that it's going on if you track back the pipeline to the origin. And I just felt that it's not fair and it's not the correct thing to do and that someone had to do something, you know, <laughs> because I just felt that it's not right. Because for me, the values of a piece of jewelry are love not disgrace, our commitment, not corruption, our nature, nor forgery. And so it's about doing the right thing to do, not only in the diamond or jewelry industry, but in every single industry. Because as you said, uh, this quote about, uh, well, what Diana was uh, saying about collaboration, this is like basically my slogan in Tracemark. I always say, this is only through collaboration that we can create a bigger impact because if we join our forces, we can really change the world for a better future, for the next generations and coming. I mean, uh, it's not only taking care of, you know, the social part, but also it's important the environmental part and also the governance in how the companies are being ruled. That's why, you know, I founded Tracemark. So basically Tracemark is the first and unique company in the world able to provide complete jewelry traceability from the mines, of uh, you know the origin going down every single step across the supply chain to the hands of the end consumer and it's not only every all the information it's uh, certified and audited but also we found a way to transform uh, traceability into a digital uh, digital experience to the end consumer so they will receive all the information on their wallet on their phones with you know, all the information that they need to align their own values with the values of the brands just to do what is right to do, basically. And um, nothing, that's it. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Berta. As you can tell, Berta, Berta powers her organization through passion, 
Yes. Uh, and yeah, the, the, um, I had a, an extremely fun call with her the, the day that I called her to tell her that she'd won the award. And th this is very mild and controlled um, compared to her, but it's a really, really amazing, cool tool that makes fantastic use of technology for good. And um, I hope people really check it out. Um, yeah. while, while, we're on, um, while we're on Jury and Diamonds, I want to move over to Megan um, and, and talk to her. There was huge celebration in our offices when we announced that Monica Vinader had won as Responsible Luxury Business of the Year. Um, the brand's leadership position in ESG has been recognized through a lot of other recent awards as well. Um, and Pulse of Luxury sort of put you forward as the, the sort of poster child um, that defines new luxury through a combination of, of what you guys call an, an innovation and integrity. Um, and I think what really impressed us and what impressed the judges is, is a lot of the actions you've taken that had formed part of your application, they weren't, they weren't easy for a business to take and, and you've made a lot of movement in a short period of time and they were very meaningful uh, in terms of impact. And I knew that because I could see the targets you had set. I could see the measures that you, have, that you were progressing. I could see the, the forward progress in your company and you were refreshingly sort of open and candid about that, not just in your application, but we see this on your website and your annual reports in a lot of your customer communications. So can you tell us about the roles, this dual role of innovation and integrity and how you feel it's played such a, a pivotal part in, in what has become a really successful and large business and how perhaps again they impact you as an employee share an example of one of the things that you know you were involved in in the company um that demonstrate where innovation meets integrity that you know you were really proud of when the team delivered sure thank you amy um i think just before i go into answering your question the the team at our ends uh celebrated i think just as much as it sounds like you guys did it at your ends uh, winning Responsible Business of the Year by Positive Luxury is a huge achievement that we are incredibly proud of as a business and a lot of work has gone into making this happen and it's a huge uh, level of kind of credibility to receive to sort of validate a lot of that work that we've put into place. I think um, to start to sort of answer your question, innovation and integrity have been really embedded in our culture at MV since Monica founded the business. And I think really that's what has driven us to where we're at today. Um, Monica started the business by really pioneering the use of gold verme um, to create a new category of jewellery between fine and between fashion so that women could be really empowered to buy for themselves. And we care really deeply about designing products for our customers that are innovative and that also have integrity. And that's integrity of design and it's the integrity of the quality of the materials. And we've worked super hard as a business to kind of build those solid principles, which the team just live and breathe every day through and through in everything that we do. And, you know, we always know that we can do better and we're constantly striving to push ourselves and to do better. But as a, as a sort of absolute baseline, making sure that we are using and sourcing materials which are responsibly and ethically sourced and really pushing ahead with our agenda for transparency and traceable materials, a little like Berta was just uh, sharing with her business. One of the other kind of core values for us as a business is uh, caring. And for us, we take that incredibly seriously, not just for our employees, but we really want to have a positive impact on our community and on the planet and really feel that responsibility to take the action and, and to do so. And a, a sort of, final core value for us is agility and there's no doubt that we could not have achieved this without our teams being incredibly agile and nimble and kind of fast paced to really quickly uh, drive and implement this change it's sort of felt quite natural to take this sustainability and to really iterate as we go feel comfortable that we don't always know the answer but to keep pushing forward to to learn and to grow uh, within the space so We've set up a, a sustainability steer co um, with a number of senior members across the team to really prioritise and to drive uh, the changes that, that we've wanted to drive. So we switched to using uh, recycled gold and silver to 100% of our supply chain using that. So uh, in early 2020, and that's reduced our carbon emissions by two thirds uh, than, than going down the mining route. 
We have reduced our single use plastic by 90% in our, sing in our supply chain, which the jewellery industry, uh, single use plastic is pretty pervasive. It, it's everywhere. So um, we are incredibly proud that we've managed to achieve that 90% figure and we will keep pushing to get that final 10% where we can. Um, we redesigned all of our packaging to be recyclable. Um, that's the shipping boxes, it's the jewellery boxes, even the, the little sort of pull tabs on the jewellery boxes. We absolutely sweated the detail that we wanted them to look luxury and, and sort of look like fabric, but they're actually made of paper and they can be recycled. Um, and we're also sort of really proud of working on initiatives that are sort of outside of our, our day to day, if you like. So um, this year we've just launched Monica's Meadow, which is uh, reserving seven hectares of former ag agricultural land so that we can introduce and increase biodiversity and carbon capture. I guess to sort of focus on your points of what I'm most proud of, I am. Um, my role is overseeing the product team and, and working with our supply chain and for me, what I'm most proud of is that we couldn't have achieved this without our supply partners. And it's really a journey that we've been on together uh, with our supply partners. When Monica founded the business um, for over 14 years ago, we, we sort of started building these solid relationships from day one uh, with the factories. And it's fair to say that we really challenged our, our suppliers over these 14 years, but equally, they've really challenged us to try and find solutions. And that's what's led to a, a number of these strong results. There's, um, you know, when we, when we started talking to our suppliers about moving to wanting to use 100% recycled gold and silver, they couldn't quite believe what we were asking of them and felt like that was going to be incredibly challenging to do. Yet we really pushed through, we've made it happen and, and a number of um, others in the industry have also followed, which is great from an environmental point of view. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Integrity and innovation are just core principles that we live and breathe that are absolutely built in within our culture. And uh, I think that's what continues to drive the good work that we've done and that we will continue to push to do. Thank you, Megan. And uh, that's why my two generation Z nieces wear Monica Vinander jewelry with huge pride. So it's, it's a great company. Um, and we've got lo lots of people in the office who are um, very visible fans as well. Um, we are out of time, so I need to wrap up. We've had one question, I believe it's for you, Lucinda, about your carbon, how you're measuring your carbon footprint, but I can pick up that with you offline so that we can come back to this person. They're just interested in what methodology um, you were using, the type of product. Um, but I want to make sure everybody can get back to their desk and get back to work. So I want to say thank you to Philip, to Megan, to Berta, to Lucinda, to Edzard, and to Mateusz. And I want to reiterate to everyone that at Positive Luxury, we've worked with hundreds of, of companies um, across the business, all trying to do really big things. But I can say with utter confidence that the six businesses you've heard from today are among those I would say are the most trustworthy and the most innovative across the entire industry. So I'm very proud to have had 45 minutes of your time today um, and wish all of you and your teams um, the best of luck in the year ahead. Um, may the journey continue. And thank you very much for setting such a great example. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.